Michael Killen, recently Jerry Brown, the governor of the state of California, George Schultz, the former Secretary of State for the United States, and also William Perry, the former Secretary of the Defense Department, also of the United States, took part in an announcement where they change the threat factors that govern the doomsday clock. The doomsday clock shares with us how many minutes, days, months, or whatever we are to major catastrophes that could occur including possibly the end of civilization. Historically, it had primarily measured or timed possible nuclear destruction, Russia and us or some other country. In 2007, they quietly added global warming to that list of threat factors. At the start of 2016, they have come out with George, Jerry, and Bill leading the charge to say that they now have raised global warming as an equal threat factor as nuclear war. And also, the organization that controls the doomsday clock also has pointed out they are now going to consider cyber threats as not at the same level as the atomic war or global warming, but as another important threat we need to keep our eye on. On this segment, I have invited an expert in cyber attacks and security, and he is Greg Edwards, and he is the chief technical officer of Kesselman Associates, a firm that specializes in digital security. And I'm going to ask him a series of questions of why is the threat of cyber attacks so prevalent and of great concern today? Greg. Thank you. Long introduction? A long introduction? Yes. Good. Now, I was wondering, before we discuss the status, let's say, of the threat of cyber, especially to the electric grid, I was wondering, since you and I have been around for quite a while, and you can remember what was happening 20, 25 years ago in the world with respect to possible cyber threats. Can you tell me what it was like back then? And, and why don't you just give me a... If you go back 18, 20 years ago, the search engines were nowhere near as good as Google. The internet was not very widely used back then. The tools of the internet, whether it's Wikipedia or instructions on how to build your own quadcopter or how to run an attack via a network, were out there, but they were harder to find and they were harder to use. We have a lot more connectivity now. We have a lot more access to knowledge. Back then, uh, let's see, you threw out a lot, but it, am I netting it all down? 25 years ago, there wasn't that much stuff out there for the world to use as computing. We had a lot of mainframes. We had some distributed computing. We were starting to use desktop computing. Uh, desktop computing, yeah, was coming around. A lot of people in Silicon Valley were very aware of it, okay. but not the rest of the world so much. Okay, so there weren't so many toys out there Okay, 25 years ago. And so therefore... 25 roughly, yeah. 35, something yeah. like, it varies. And, and so, you know, the networks were not that prevalent in the world, okay. Uh, so now, what is the world of networking, the world connecting to the electric grid for some, and I bring up the electric grid because as you pointed out to me, it is one, possibly the most critical piece of infrastructure, of all the pieces of infrastructure in any developed country. If the grid goes down, the lights go out. It, you know, as soon as your battery's, you know, disaster. So would you try to put what the world is like right now 
with our concern about cyber threats, especially to the grid? There are a lot of cyber attacks going on all over the world all the time. There are a lot of major successful ones in general. With respect to the grid, there have only been a few around the world that have been successful. Would you, do you remember what a few of them were that? There are two major threats, two major attacks on the grid. One was in the Ukraine eight last year, and that was a deliberate attack. The other was thought to be an attack, but turned out to be just rogue malware that wasn't really designed to do it, um, I believe in Israel about a week ago. That was first announced as an attack. Later came out, no, it wasn't. It was just malware that's messing up computers. The Ukraine attack, what was the target? The target was the country of Ukraine, and it was probably done by people who were very hostile to the Ukraine. Oh, so it was an attempt to knock the government down, the main yes. institutions. Yeah. And then there was attack in Israel? It and was thought at first to be an attack, but it turned out to be just malware. malware. It wasn't a deliberately so planned attack. Was there any particular part of the systems over there that was hit? Well, I don't have the details. But then there was the attack in Iran. Are what, you talking? Oh, but that's not the grid, though. Are you talking about the attack on the Iranian centrifuges? Yes. Yeah. yeah, but that's not the electric grid, but that's an example of a significant cyber attack. That was a significant cyber attack, and it went through an air gap system and took it even though there's no internet connection. Now today, and I want to share what you told me about some very specific new developments that have occurred in the last few years that tend to create new opportunities to attack the grid. And so I'm just going to start it out. One of them is the increase of Internet of Things. Yes. You want to give me another one? The increase in the amount of intelligence that's being used in the power grid itself. That intelligence can help, but it can't replace if you don't have the major line segments delivering power, it can't generate power on its own. It can only reshuffle who gets the power. Do you want to throw out another one? There's a lot more people who are aware that you could do these attacks, and there's a lot more knowledge on how to do the attacks. So the threat surface becomes larger. I believe Larry Ellison said in an office that we are not to hire anyone um, who has an advanced degree, let's say at Stanford, in computer sciences, that may have also gone to the Chow Tung University in Shanghai, and not to hire them and put them in a position where they can be near not just electric grids, but any type of network. So I'm just sort of corroborating your statement that there is more talent out there than ever. There's an incredible number of very smart people who are hostile to the U.S. out there. The Internet of Things, I'm going back to it. Why is the increase of Internet of Things, and what is it, creating so many new doors, opportunities into the, the systems that manage the electric grid? The Internet of Things is the connectivity and intelligence and sensors that are put at the endpoints. The typical example of Internet of Things is a sensor and intelligence in your refrigerator to let you know when the milk's gone sour and it's time to get new one. Okay, we want to talk about the inter grid. Intelligence of Things will allow you to have more sensors connecting to the power grid and more controls. A crude example right now is if there is going to be a power failure in an area PG&E will try very hard to keep power going to the hospitals and drop everyone else. If it's not quite so bad, PG&E has a list of the people who have medical equipment at home and need electricity, and they'll try and save them. The first people who will lose power will be industries that have get a lower rate from PG&E, and then the understanding if there's a shortage, they'll be chopped off first. 
with Internet of Things on the grid, we can manipulate this to a finer degree. So maybe every house gets one outlet that works and all the rest stop if there's a major shortage. Okay, that's very good. Recently, Ted Koppel wrote a book called Lights Out, and he focused on the electric grid and one specific form of attack, cyber. I know you read that book, and you know that book is not written for you, is it? I mean, no. you're deep and broad in the area of networking, cyber, et cetera, but it's more useful for, let's say, the business executive, maybe somebody like me who's an artist, okay, but I'm not in the networks whatsoever. What do you think is the value of that book to business executives and managers, those that are not on top of the electric, uh, the circuitry, the systems. The material in the book is valuable and it's pointless. The executives aren't going to have time to read it. They may read an executive summary. Uh, some of their techie people who already know a lot may say, yes, we need to pay more attention to this. But the average senior executive doesn't have time to read that sort of thing. Okay. If they, so if for some reason they don't have the time, is it because they don't have a appreciation for the risks that are involved and the costs that are involved? I think most executives are well aware that there are a lot of cyber problems out there and a lot of vulnerabilities. They may not be aware of how vulnerable the grid is, electrical grid is, to attack. But they're aware of a lot of attacks on a lot of companies. It's a risk, and they have to figure out what that company's appetite for risk is, how much risk they're willing to accept, and try and make their best judgment and their workarounds to take into account various problems like this. So. I was never clear until recently about the cyber attacks on Target, you know, the retailer. Do you have any insights on how that attack occurred that allowed uh, the attackers to grab hold of thousands and thousands of credit cards? There are a lot of different ways to attack retail businesses. A lot of them have been attacked successfully. The best person who writes on this is Brian Krebs, K-R-E-B-S. And if you go to his website and search any attack you wish, you'll probably find a very well-written article on that. And that goes right down to uh, scanners that steal your credit card data. Okay. Now, I know because I've seen you at Lockheed Martin in their advanced technology center giving a speech to a whole group of computer scientists, network type folks. And I think when I sat there, I was the only animal of my kind. And I was impressed with your knowledge. And uh, I just wonder what can be done today to present prevent um, attacks from succeeding? We know how to stop the standard kind of attacks. I'm excluding the black swan attacks. The question is, can we get the resources, in particular skilled people and the money to do it? Management needs to decide how much risk they want to accept and how much they're willing to pay to keep the risk at the level they're willing to accept. If they make a mistake on the amount of risk that they think they're buying or protecting from, then there's going to be major problems. And I think most companies are taking too much risk. So this is a, this is a problem of education. OK. Of uh, the executives, corporate, the board of directors. Yes. Having a understanding of the risk cost trade-offs mm -hmm. and the damage. Now, you brought up the black swan. What is the black swan? A black swan is a highly 
unanticipated or very rare event. The, a classic example is an asteroid hitting the Earth. It only happens about once a century, but if it hits a populated area, it's going to cost a lot, an awful lot of death and damages. But it's only going to happen maybe once a century, maybe once every thousand years. So <clears throat> people are not very willing to pay the cost to protect. Would this be a black swan if I had the capability, let's say there's a thousand SCADA systems, and, and those are control and uh, sensors, okay, that nodes that really control parts of the network, a thousand of them. And if I, using some sort of cyber, am able to cause a perturbation that knocks out a hundred of them, would that be what you would call a black swan? No, because there's a lot more than a thousand SCADA systems in a typical electrical grid. If you could knock out the electrical grid for Palo Alto, that would be unfortunate for the people in Palo Alto, but I wouldn't really call it a black swan event. If you could knock out all the power to California for a month, that'd be a black swan. Okay, and do you have an idea how to do that? I, but we don't want to go into anything too deep. I mean, uh, just give me a magnitude of destruction of the power lines coming from the East Coast and Nevada to here. The power lines are mostly overloaded. It, power lines are not my field. My field okay. is cyber. And any time that you have control systems that send data across the Internet, there's probably going to be a way to affect that data movement. Okay, so we're thinking about winding up the interview. And, and before I move forward, do you have any questions of me? Any points that you feel uh, would be worthwhile to bring up? There's going to be problems. The more we use computers, the more we enrich our lives with computers, the more our attack surface on us exists. The more we develop friends around the world, the more chance there is for not so friendly people. Someone tries to friend you on Facebook, and you look at it, and they have one or two pictures of themselves and no friends. That's not a person you want to be friends oh, with. Oh, really? You have friends who have no other friends? I'd run away from them. If I have what kind of friend? friends? Friends oh, no on Facebook have no other friends. That is interesting. No pictures so of themselves. you think just logging on and posting and accepting, you know, whatever on Facebook, that could be a danger? Sure, because they get information to you, they start connecting with you. I was helping some people, a friend of a friend who, two days ago, who got a notice saying, your computer's infected, call this number, and they called it. And it's, oh yes, we can help you, you have a terrible virus, we'll take care of this for only $5,000. Yeah. Yeah. I'm slightly exaggerating, but the people lost their credit card and they almost lost their internet bank account. Interesting. So, do you have any recommendations for uh, corporations that, utilities and electric grid folks and <clears throat> the the uh, CTOs and the security experts and... Figure out what your risks are and what your risk appetite is. How much risk are you willing to take? If your company is down for three days, it has roughly a 50% chance of going bankrupt. Okay. And you got that from the security auditors? That, <clears throat> that's from the ISACA. That's the Institute of Computer Security Auditors. So that's their thinking about how dangerous uh, that a, a uh, cyber attack could be not yes. coming down for three days and some could of them could be will a go flood that wipes out your data center. <clears throat> okay, if people want to contact you, how do they do it? Um, you have my email address. I think it's being displayed. Or maybe you want to say it here. If not, uh, Greg whatever. at Kesselman Associates. Uh, uh, Kesselman Associates. All right. So, Greg Edwards, I want to say thank you very much for being a guest and sharing your wisdom Thank you. and knowledge with us. Hi, my guest has been Greg Edwards, and he is a security, cybersecurity expert 
and um, we greatly value his insight.